via telephone, financial Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriads Group. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Splendid, I believe. Last we checked. You sound like you are. Uh, we are. <laughs> Phil, will you drop by today and help us eat some of this chocolate slash coconut cake? We're not sure exactly. <laughs> little, let's throw carrot cake in there as well. <laughs> Could be a carrot cake. <laughs> Who knows what we have in there? We don't know. I didn't. I didn't hear the. I didn't hear about that cake. Who brought that in? Bill Stubblefield's wife, Bonnie. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure it's fantastic, Phil. Well, you know the sure story. Is. The first time she was going to get a coconut cake, but it looked very much and tasted very much like a carrot cake. This time she was going to get a chocolate cake and comes out looking very much like a coconut cake. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> uh, Bill Kern just texted me and said, in celebration of my birthday, we're providing free rate on test kits for anyone that comes in and mentions Rob Mario's name or has a birthday themselves. Uh, Phil, let's talk markets here because uh, it's been a pretty good January. In fact, I think you trace it back to October, but it's uh, at the moment an improving yet still down day. Yeah, well, and when we look at the 2023 as a whole, or NASDAQ, which is what struggled most in 2022, is up almost 12% for 2023. And that's one month performance. That's quite a recovery. But we have to keep in mind from last year, that's also what struggled the most. Uh, S&P, which I always say like uh, it's the one you should pay attention to the most, is up 6.5%. That is a incredible month that we've had. And you're right, it does track back to beginning October 1st of the last quarter of 2022. So it's been somewhat sustained. Now, it's not long enough to say, oh, we can take a deep breath now, everything's back to normal. Of course not, but it is a positive sign that this has lasted longer than what it had before. We had in March of last year, we had a really good March of 2022, and we quickly gave that away. We had an incredible, I think it was uh, July and half of August, and guess what put it into that? But Jerome Powell's words put it into that really quickly. And if I'm, and, and I could be mistaken on this, so don't hold me to it, but I think September was the worst month that we had in 2022. And it was on the, on the back of Jerome Powell's words or his rhetoric or his tone, his jawboning, that's becoming a popular word, his jawboning when he spoke at Jackson Hole. And guess what we're getting here in a couple of days? but Jerome Powell speaking again. So it's going to be his forward-looking statements or how he sounds in his rhetoric to, that would drive us more so probably than what the increase is going to be. We all expect a quarter of a percent. So if he does more, of course, that's going to injure us some in our markets. But what's he going to say moving forward? How long is this going to last? How long are they going to leave it here? What signs, what data do we need to see to say that, hey, we're going to stop and pause I think a pivot is far, far away, and a pivot just means they're going to start reducing it. A pivot would be a result of something really bad, like a, a hard landing in, in, in a recession that looks like it's going to last longer than what our markets have baked in. But last week, and you had asked us this morning, are we to a point, and maybe so, are we to a point where good news could be good news again? And maybe we are because that gives us some indication that maybe, just maybe we can accomplish this soft landing and not go into a recession. And that's what that GDP number did for us last week, and where people started to say, huh, maybe we can do this, because we see inflation coming down at a pretty quick clip. Now, we know, or we think anyway, that there's a few things that's going to be more sticky. So we'll get to a point with inflation, and we can't bust through that. And that's what we need to hear from the Federal Reserve. What are they going to do when we get there? We're just going to continue to ride and let all of the increases that we had done in 2022, and of course this quarter of a percent, hopefully, quarter of a percent that he does here in a couple of days, make its way through our economy to see if that is enough to bust through the sticky inflation. When I say sticky, I'm really pointing at wage, wage inflation and grocery store prices. We all have our stories with grocery store prices, but with food pricing, is that, will that bust through that? But we have seen with the price of energy and used cars and some of these headline things that we had dealt with in 2022 has subsided quite a bit and at a pretty fast pace. You mentioned cars there, Phil, and obviously the car inflation, like everything else, kind of got out of control there for a while. Uh, and then Tesla announced that they would cut car prices 20%. And then Ford today has announced they're going to cut prices on their Mustang Mach-E following Tesla's lead. And I, sus I suspect then, Phil, when you have two of the more popular automobile manufacturers now in Tesla and Ford announcing that, 
does it stand to reason that others are going to have to do the same to remain competitive with them? It may, but I think it means more for maybe the used car market than it does the new car market because the the, the price of new cars is what drives the price of used cars. And last year, the used car, and I, I never really thought that the price of used cars would have such an impact on our overall economy as it did in 2022. But if you if you can't get these vehicles, or like that was the issue in 2022 because of chips, you can't get the new cars, well, that makes the used car market even stronger and more expensive. And, and just like groceries, we've all got our stories about so-and-so traded in a car that they had bought two years ago or sold it outright and got 2000 more for it. That's a crazy environment. But if they're cutting the prices of new cars, and I know those are e-models or EV models, but if they're cutting the price of new cars, that will make its way down to used cars as well. And, and that's, that's going to be really important. Even if the others don't do the same, they'll probably be in a wait-and-see mode. But that comes from an abundance of inventory, and we can't sell it. Now, that demand, and that and that's all part of the Federal Reserve, because most people, or a, or a heavy percentage of people anyway, are borrowing money to buy cars. And it's not the same as it was a year and a half ago. You know, you're paying 4 or 5 6 7% interest to borrow money, and you can't get the same kind of car that you could before because of that price of borrowed money. And that has kind of led to some of this. Now we may be, in some in some cases, see a glut. Could you imagine that? A glut of inventory to where they have to reduce prices in order to make up for that additional cost that you're seeing from the cost of borrowed money. I think I heard that the average price of a used car last year reached 31000 something And I think that was actually down a couple hundred bucks from its peak. So the prices had started to recede. But... You think about a used car, you don't think about spending $31,000, do you, John or Bill? I certainly don't. No. I got a question for you, Phil. We've seen Meta and Alphabet and now Amazon, all these big companies are laying off employees by the tens of thousands. What do we think is the long term? What, what, is it a harbinger of bad things? And what, how does that get absorbed into the economy? Um, maybe in particular, because I thought the same thing. You know, so Microsoft laid off a bunch and Facebook had laid off a bunch, and some of these companies are reporting this week, too, by the way, and that's going to be a big day as well. But as I understand, anyway, that the portion that these that the, these tech companies make up of our overall job market was only 2%. So while it, you know them laying that off is something the Federal Reserve may take a glance at, but it doesn't make up that big of a population of our overall uh, job economy, so therefore it may not have much impact on our overall job market but it will have an impact on those companies. And here's why these are so important. I think the NASDAQ is more important now than what it's ever been because of the size of these companies, their market weight of these companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, all these guys make up such a big portion of our portfolios. Go open up your portfolio if you're, if you're invested in mutual funds, and honestly most, people, most of us are. If you're invested in mutual funds, you're going to see those companies at the very top of the list not as, as in, the, in so much where uh, money managers or exchange-traded funds, that's where a lot of it lies as well, where they think, hey, these are the greatest companies ever, but because of the size of these companies, they're so big now, their market weighting, I should say, is so large that they find their way and they have an overwhelming impact on the movement of our, of our portfolios. And these are large-cap growth companies that are also housed in the S&P and NASDAQ, but they make up more of the NASDAQ than they do the S&P 500. That's why we always pay to the S&P. There's 500 companies in there. But so when we see the NASDAQ move sharply, it does impact our portfolio on a more uh, on a heavier weighting than what it did maybe in 2005, 2010. So it does mean something. But when they lay those off, now that, that's another good news is bad news. In most cases... The, when companies lay have layoffs, the stock price goes up. And the stock price goes up because investors are saying, hey, they're making price cuts in order to make a profit. Now, we don't want to see people lose their jobs, but if I lay off 10,000 people, well, my bottom line is certainly going to be less. And, and from what I produce or what, what I make or revenue is going to make its way through to investors. And therefore, the, the stock price goes up. So some of that bad, that, that bad news that's to that one company 
um, and, and oftentimes so stock price is good news. But it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what their earnings are because these are the Fang stocks we talked so much about in early COVID days. Where Fang everything was Fang and it was going up so fast and so hard, and they they're the true benefactor of of our COVID economy. With uh, especially Apple, and everybody had to have an iPad and Amazon. You couldn't buy anything unless you got it from Amazon and Facebook because we were all home, and that was how we were sharing our stories and Facebook Live. And they were the true benefactors, and they were also the ones that got hurt the most last year because as our world continued to reopen, and now you don't have any more subscribers. How do you continue to grow when everybody in the world is one of your subscribers? What else do you do to make money and they're more subject to the movement of interest rates because of their growth nature. When interest rates go up, they struggle more. But on the flip side, we see this in 2023. They have been the ones that have done the best. So we'll, th- this, these earnings this week, is, I think that's going to be huge. May even rival what Jerome Powell says, and it's been a while since we could say that. Uh, Phil, another, uh, some companies are hiring, other sectors are hiring, such as Bowen's uh, recently announced they're going to hire 100,000 people this coming year. But my question is, there's a 600-pound gorilla in the room uh, that has not been talked about very much now, but it's going to be talked about increasing in the next six months, and that is our debt ceiling. Uh, has the debt ceiling responded or do you anticipate the debt ceiling uh, the uh the, the congress will respond in terms of debt ceiling uh and the market comp uh comparably i didn't get that out right will there be a response to the debt ceiling discussion in the markets it doesn't seem to be it always seems to be that they'll just increase the debt ceiling because that's very important to our markets and especially let's look at bonds our bond market and our credit rating as a country it has never really seemed to have a big impact on our market, other than maybe a day or so, but nothing long-lasting. There's always this, this belief that they will continue to raise the debt ceiling to the point where we can pay our bills because it is so important that our bond ratings stay the, the highest in the world that we, that we maintain that rating and without increasing it. So our market just says, well, they'll, they'll get it done. I know they will. Uh, at the end of the day, and, and other than a day or two, it really never has had that much impact on our markets. And I don't know that it's even in their in, the, in its scope right now, where it's you know on the back burner, where our markets. And I'm talking about our markets with blinders on, are really that concerned with it. Well, 2011, it had an impact on the market. Uh, shortly, but it didn't last. I mean, if you look at how long it went it went for, it well, wasn't it wasn't anything that was long lasting like these COVID markets. And you have to remember, we're always looking in terms of long-lasting. What moves us for a day or a month or a week or even a quarter? It kind of just kind of falls away, and we re, if we regain it, then that's not long-lasting. We say that about, about foreign markets all the time, right? We're, it seems as if we're dismissive over foreign markets. It's not that we're dismissive over it, but we know that the news in China sometimes can be a different story. But we know that the news overseas isn't long-lasting, and whatever we tend to gain or give up from it is going to repair itself fairly shortly. And that is kind of the way with our debt ceiling as well. Yeah. Uh, in 2011, it repaired itself after the agreement had been made. And, uh, yes. and and I agree with you, uh, Phil. I think there will be an agreement. But I also believe in the next six months there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, – fairly uh, vicious discussion on both sides of this equation, and I'm just curious how much impact that will have on the market. Probably, as you say, uh, not too much, and it will heal itself fairly quick. Or short-lived, and we do have a tendency, myself included, to look at our market's performance over a short period of time and then give whatever is in the headlines credit or blame for what just happened, and sometimes that's not really the case. I think it's I think it's funny to see on Options Friday. Options Friday always brings about a lot of volatility, but whatever else, and that's something that's difficult to understand for most people. It's not going to attract a lot of eyeballs in the newspaper or on online if you're looking for news or trying to figure out what happened to the market. So we just tend to just point to whatever happened that day. It could have been anything that has nothing related to do with the market's at all, but we'll point to that and say, well, that's what caused the market to go up or down, and we'll follow that narrative until something else comes up. So it's the news of the day. But I think options, I always get excited for Options Friday. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. But but on Options Friday, there's always a lot of volatility because there's these old contracts sitting out there that must come, come to an end, and that's forced buying and selling, and that causes volatility. So 
sometimes. Sometimes it, it, due to what had happened six, nine, 12 months ago, those contracts were put in place. It could be calm waters moving along, which we don't see that often anymore, but we, it could be calm waters in our markets. But that Options Friday brings about a, a lot of movement one way or the other based off what we thought when those contracts were written. I, th- I think it's very interesting. I'd, I'd like to read pieces on that to see, like, Options Friday, the movement in our markets from intraday or overnight. It's really neat. But we do tend to just point to whatever happened that day and say, well, this is what caused it. Uh, let me go back very quickly to the debt ceiling from a different perspective that I have not thought about, and that's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve responsibilities try to make uh, tweaks to the uh, our interest rates to try to keep the inflation and our economy on somewhat of a leave, uh, level even kill. Uh, with the debt ceiling and with the dis- with the possibility, we cannot ignore the fact there is a possibility that there will not be an agreement. Uh, will is there? What will the Federal Reserve be doing in these next few months, if anything? Uh, in regards to the debt ceiling, probably nothing. Okay. And I, I, I question whether they would even utter that word out of their mouth uh, when they're talking about what they're doing. They're completely focused right now on slowing the economy, trying to get that supply and demand equilibrium in range without throwing us into a, that they're going to attempt. I mean, they will, but without throwing us into a recession. I don't know that in the short term, six, nine months, that it would even utter, anything would leave their mouths. And, and honestly, even if we didn't come to an agreement, I don't know that there's any movement that the Federal Reserve could do that would help anything because it would be all market-based at that point. And they're not supposed to care. And I don't know that they do or they don't. I'm one that it, it, me and Rob talk about the Federal Reserve quite often. I tend to give, give them a pass. Um, a lot, and Rob's ready to hang them sometimes. But hang is such a strong <laughs> word, Phil. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But the but they're they're not supposed to really react based off of anything in our markets. They're supposed to be solely focused on those few things that they're responsible for. Well, let's play the disaster game here for a minute. There's there's a lot of brinksmanship going on in D.C. right now, and there's a lot of. Um, pressure on Speaker McCarthy to derail or, or to slow down or get in the way of um, the, the uh, Democrats' spending. So if, in fact, they decide to fall on this sword and, and, and they don't blink and the administration doesn't blink, what is the, what's the net effect? We talk about we want to have the best bond ratings in, on the planet, and that's, that's great, but if, if we don't, then who would? I mean, that would trigger... A, a lot of bad things. What is what's the run out of of brinksmanship that doesn't end on the debt ceiling? Well, if it didn't come, you know, if we're playing disaster, and I think the the longer term impact would be on more on our bonds, on our outstanding, and our ability to issue bonds in, into the future, and the rates that we would have to pay once we issue those. So we have to remember with our good credit when our country issues bonds, then we get to do it at the lowest rates almost possible without I mean, municipalities get a little bit lower rate, but they can issue it at the lowest rates possible. And if our, if our country's credit comes into question, those bonds now must be issued at a higher rate. And then think of companies when they borrow money, uh, that, that could be the same issue with them as well. So that that's where it would the longer term impact. And Bill had mentioned 2011, where it took a little bit before they signed the agreement. But any longer-term impact, I think, would be more on our bond side, which we don't talk a lot about because it's kind of boring, more so than on our equity side. Our equity side would be more volatile in the short term, but longer-term issues would come come to about in our in our um, on the on the bond side. Especially think of those TSPs at G Fund; it's full of U.S. government bonds. Phil, I know you were volleyball Phil over the weekend. By the way, how'd your team do? Uh, team did well. We finished second out of 47 teams, so Ooh. they did They did well. The girls played hard. Very nice. Very nice. So we've got one, two first-place finishes and a second-place finish. You, you know, you, you got a – you're like the Bill Belichick of volleyball is what you are. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I've got a bunch of Berkeley County kids that come down to, to uh, Virginia to play volleyball, and I think that's my secret. <laughs> well, good recruiting then. Hey, yeah. uh, the, I know you missed uh, the Philly San Francisco game, which really wasn't worth watching. Philly, I mean, uh, they knocked uh, Purdy out pretty soon, and then Johnson got a concussion, uh, and, and they're Purdy running out pretty soon. That was pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Christian McCaffrey <laughs> was running quarterback for a while, and 
Uh, it's possible Purdy might need Tommy John surgery, and he actually came in and hurled a couple of screen passes. But it was 31-7. That was the game that was not worth watching after Purdy got hurt. But the second game was a typical Bengals-Chiefs game. That was always end by, by three points. But it ended in somewhat interesting fashion with a late hit out of bounds on a Cincinnati uh, defensive player, which put Kansas City in field goal range. They were able to boot a field goal and, and win the game. Uh, and Kansas City's going to the Super Bowl to play Philadelphia. Uh, some people were upset about that call. I thought it was a good call. Mahomes was out of bounds. He got hit out of bounds. You got to throw the flag, even if that flag determines the outcome of the game. Phil, what do you think? Well, yeah, and I, I know that you've got to make that call. And it was, I saw it, and it was a late hit, and I just thought, please don't throw that flag. Please don't let this play be determined about that. And I know you don't call it for intent, but he didn't intend to do that. I think you can kind of tell that that wasn't his intention. I just hate for a game, such a well-played game between probably the two best teams in the NFL, but such a well-played game to end on that. And, and, I, and I get it, though. You have to call the game. You can't leave it to the referee and say, well, it's too important to call that right now. Yeah, but you have to call it. I just didn't like it. Uh, so I, I don't know how else to say it. I just didn't like it. It just took the, it, my competitive spirit. I was like, man, I hate that. I wanted to see them earn their way down there instead of luck their way down there, I guess I should say. But at the end of the day, though, you got you got to know where you're at. You, not to, and I, I guess his emotion got the best of him. And when Patrick Mahomes took off, he was so intent on getting him out of bounds, he didn't realize where he was. But I, I did feel – and I, I know I get it. I hate the Bengals because they're in the AFC North, but there was a piece of them that felt bad that they lost the game that way. But you got to make the call, though. No pieces of me felt bad the Bengals lost, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, all, all the pieces of me were like, yeah. And I'm not a Chiefs fan. You, just... you are truly a nice guy, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you one thing that the NFL and, and I think all of football is going to have to address going forward, and, and that is in regards to quarterbacks running. There was a play when Joe Burrow escaped up the middle to convert a third and long. You know, the linebacker was kind of pulling off thinking that Burrow was going to slide. He didn't. And he didn't, and he runs for the first down. Now, Burrow didn't fake a slide, but if Burrow slides late and the linebacker already commits and hits him, well, now you've got a personal foul penalty. And I think, that, and, and so as a result, defenders, when a quarterback runs, pull off because we know you can't breathe on a quarterback or you get a penalty. I think it's going to have to be addressed going forward because it really puts defenders in a bad situation when a quarterback's running. It you know, does. I don't think I don't think they'll address it though because the stars of the league are the Mahomes and the Burrows and the Josh Allens and hopefully the Kenny Pickett soon uh, of the league and they want those guys playing and they want them upright and playing as long as humanly possible. So if it just becomes a, a little bit of an unfair advantage and so be it. But that, that you noticed over the last five or six years since these rules come into play. Running quarterbacks is more of a thing than what it used to be. Yeah. Uh, I, my sense is that football is being diluted with all these exceptions, all these protections. And it's, we've lost some of, the, some of the excitement in football. Bill advocates taking the face mask off that helmet. Well, that and all. him leather again. <laughs> that and also with the uh, uh, punt punt returns and the like. There's a lot of I agree. A lot of rules. No, I, I agree. Uh, no, I, your point is a good one. It has been diluted. And when you watch a quarterback get sacked, and they call it roughing the quarterback, and you look, it me you go, what? He, he's 300 pounds. He had to land on him. What are you going to do, Phil? How do people reach you for more information about what you're doing there with financial services? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. You guys do the same. And Thanks, Phil. Phil. You can catch Phil's uh, daily financial reports each morning at 638 and then replayed at 738 Monday through Friday uh, right here.